Honey, where are you? Fred! Four members of this young woman's family would never be seen alive again. Inside the house was evidence that would not only lead investigators to the killer... It was a callous, outright murder. ...but would uncover a secret buried for three years. My concern was if he had, in fact, got away with it, it uh, resulted in the deaths of the other four. It should never have occurred. There were questions that needed to be answered. We did it because we had to know. We couldn't establish how it would have happened. It just couldn't have happened the way he said it did. If you look at the scale damage in these, that's not consistent with that. And that, in his mind, was his way of, I suppose, explaining what he'd done. And uh, the further we went, the worse it got for him. For three days, members of the Milosevic family had been trying to contact Rad Miller, or Rad, as she liked to be called. But calls to Rad and her de facto husband, Tony, had gone unanswered. And for a family who spoke to each other every day, it was a matter of deep concern. Rad! There was a phone call made from Tony's employer that he hadn't turned up for work for a couple of days and they were quite concerned as it wasn't like Tony not to be at work. The car was in the driveway and nobody came to the door and Dara started to get a bit worried. Dara was Rad's 18-year-old sister. She looked through the window and noticed some paper burned around the stove and the stove was actually glowing the hot plates on the stove. She wanted to break the window and go in, but her boyfriend stopped her and told her that they would call the police and get the police there. He didn't want her to go in. I was on duty in Canberra on the 31st of March 1984 uh, with another detective, another young detective, and uh, we were the only two detectives on in Canberra for that particular day. I received a call on the uh, police radio from our operations room that the police officer in attendance had smashed a hole with his baton in the back door of the house and entered. There was a strong smell of petrol in the house. It was obvious that there was an attempt to set the place on fire. In one of the back bedrooms, there were three bodies, uh, two adults, male and female, and a small girl. They'd been piled up and they'd been doused in petrol. And in another bedroom, there was a young male child, obviously all victims of gunshot wounds. We were only young people 20 years ago ourselves, and we all had young children as well, so it was pretty horrific, you know. I was actually elsewhere with another sister, um, Rad's other sister, um, and we were in a nightclub at the time, and, and a friend had come up and said to the other sister that something terrible had happened to Rad and Tony, that we had to leave. An entire family had been wiped out. Radmila Milosevic, her de facto husband, Tony Baker, and their two small children, Danny and Lisa, were dead. When they took us to Richardson, they made us wait in the car. The, the house was all um, taped around, and somebody had come out and told Rad's sister that they'd been shot and they were found in the house, Rad, Tony, and the kids. She was just out of her mind. She just was screaming and, and, and so upset after going through it two years previously, losing Marin and Lily. 
Tragedy had already struck the Milosevic family. Mariana and Lily, Radmila's younger sisters, died just before New Year's Eve of 1981 in a car accident. You couldn't comprehend another four from the same family, Marin and Lily, and now Rad and Tony and the kids. It, it was just unbelievable. The surrounding the case, they say, are extremely unusual. The police broke into this house at about 9.30 last night to find the bodies of a young man, a young woman, and their two small children. The bodies were all in various parts of the house, there was no sign of any struggle, but kerosene had been doused on the walls. There was no break and enter on the house. The house had been locked up. There were no broken windows. It was quite calm as far as that, that was concerned. And there was evidence that the offender had attempted to clean up blood stains with a bottle of Jif from the kitchen. <laughs> And in their attempts to clean it up, they'd made more of a mess, so the person just put cushions over the bloodstains and sort of hid things. The murderer also tried to hide his tracks by attempting to set fire to the house. The stove consisted of two small hot plates towards the back of the range, and at the front of the range was a sort of a square grill-type hot plate arrangement. And the two back hot plates were glowing red hot, but not the front one. The person who turned the stove on had, in their haste, had turned all the knobs the same way, and in the hot plate at the front where he'd stuffed newspaper around the grill didn't ignite because the, the switch was turned in the wrong direction. It was on low instead of high. The scientific squad has been trying to piece together some story or pattern. They believe the shooting could have taken place as long ago as Friday. But a search inside the house suggested it could have been earlier. The failed attempt to burn down the house meant that Radmilla's diary remained intact, a diary she wrote up religiously every night. And it was just an old school book that she used to write up the day's events in. And the last entry was dated Wednesday, the 28th of March. And the entry was that her husband and a guy called Tomo were listening to the radio for the, the football that was on on the midweek game. And that was the last entry. So we knew we had another person in the house at that time, the last time that the people were obviously alive. This morning, from their mobile field unit, the police conducted a door knock, but very few of the neighbours knew anything about the family, and none of them had heard any of the gun blasts. But people had seen a distinctive car travelling backwards and forwards to the house after the Wednesday. And we had some information there that indicated that perhaps that car might have belonged to the person Tomo. So we needed to find out who Tomo was and where Tomo was now. These investigations are continuing into this evening. They're still interviewing the family's friends and relatives, but haven't determined even a possible motive. It had now been some hours since the bodies of Rad, Tony and their children had been found shot dead in their home. With no known reason as to why they were murdered, detectives needed to speak with the last person who had seen them alive. And that was a bloke called Tomo. We eventually identified Tomo as a guy called Alan Thompson, who was a close family friend. In fact, he was a long-term mate of the male victim of the scene. Uh, I think they used to play football together. He was my big brother. He was do anything for me, trusted him. I guess he was the big brother I never had, and, and he was one of the family. I think he actually taught me to drive at, at 13, 14 years of old illegally um, along the road, and he'd drive us to a school disco. He'd go home and he'd come back and pick us up when we were finished, so we, we were always with Tomo. Well, the diary entries indicated that this Tomo had turned up on a regular basis and he would play with the kids and there were some comments in there about him eating all of their food. So we knew that he was a regular visitor to the house. He was also a boyfriend of one of the two sisters who were killed in a road vehicle accident some years prior. Tom, I met Mariana one night. Him and a friend were chucking laps of the main street. 
and Mariana and one of her sisters were in the, in the city and they happened to pull over and start speaking to them and talking and I guess it just went from there. Before long, the young couple moved in together and were hardly ever seen apart. So when Mariana died in a car crash less than two years later, Alan turned to her elder sister, Rad, and her de facto husband, Tony, for company. Most of his days and nights were spent here at their house. We also established that he owned a motor vehicle similar to the description of the one that the neighbours had told us about who, that was coming and going from the, from the premises. So was Tomo a possible suspect? Or simply the last person to see his friends alive? My partner and I um, travelled to Queanbeyan and uh, were actually greeted at the door by Helen. And when I introduced myself and said who I was, I'm the bearer of bad news. I said, I've just come from the house of your friends in Richardson. Um, we found them all dead. At the crime scene, ballistics experts had found spent casings and bullets that indicated the murder weapon was a 22 calibre rifle. He was asked whether he owned a, a rifle. He took us to a shed in the back of his parents' home where he unlocked it and produced a uh, 22 rifle. And we uh, came back to Canberra to police headquarters and handed the gun over to our ballistics expert. All right, check and clear. Great, thanks Eric. They took us to the local police station, then proceeded to question us on Tomo, um, asking us if he had guns or if, you know, was there any reason why, you know, we would think that it would be him. And I just said Tomo wouldn't do it, Tomo didn't do it. He wouldn't do something like that. At the forensic laboratory, the ballistic expert fired bullets from Thompson's gun. Under the microscope at 20 magnifications, the bullets were then compared to those found at the crime scene to either identify or eliminate the rifle Thompson had given to the police. What we're looking at is a test sample on the left-hand side and the exhibit on the right-hand side. And we're looking for lines that are created by marks that are left on the interior of the barrel and the land itself and they emboss those particulate marks on the lands. They're a unique set of marks because they're like a ballistic fingerprint. So they're unique only to this one particular firearm. And that allows us to make an identification or a, an elimination. In this case, we've made an identification. It was the following day that we had some information come forward from our inquiries that Thompson had gone to a petrol station in the outskirts of Queanbeyan and purchased a tin of petrol. That tin was actually found at the crime scene and it was him coming back to the scene that the neighbours saw the car. So it became obvious that Alan Thompson was our offender and we subjected him to interview, produced the evidence and initially he denied any involvement in the murders of those people. But then he said, I went out to the car and got the gun and just come inside and just to start a shooting. But he said he didn't know what he was doing. He was just randomly firing throughout the house. Well, that didn't match with the scene that the ballistic expert had recreated. It was more deliberate firing and, and aiming rather than just shooting around wantonly and, and not knowing what you were doing. As the bullet exits the muzzle of a gun, the pressure behind it blows gunshot residue through the barrel and into the air. You can just confirm that's hard up against contact. The closer the rifle to the target, okay, the right more there. concentrated the gunshot residue around the you're bullet right. entry okay. hole. Firing! The further away, the less dense it becomes. So when the experts compared the results they got from Thompson's gun to the gunshot residue around the bullet holes of his victims, they were able to establish how far away Thompson was from each family member when he pulled the trigger. Firing. We established that 
I say we, I think the ballistics expert <laughs> established that the offender had first fired from the entry hallway of the house across to where an armchair was in the lounge room where the woman was sitting with the young girl on her lap. It's then that the husband started to lift himself up from the chair and the offender shot him then in the chest and he then tried to get out of the lounge room and he went around a small wall into the hallway and he was shot then at point blank range to the back of the head and then the little girl who had obviously fallen off her mother's lap she was shot in the lounge room on the floor from a short distance and we believe that he dragged those bodies up the hallway then and piled them up in the back bedroom and then at some stage that night he the, the male child was shot in bed at point blank range so it was a uh, it was a callous outright murder 24 year old thompson was charged with four counts of murder but pleaded not guilty at the trial i didn't want to believe that tom i did it it was mainly sitting in court and listening to to the evidence and the forensic evidence everything that that went with the case Thompson was found guilty and was sentenced to four terms of life imprisonment to be served concurrently. And we never ever found out the motive for the murder, but I think following the death of his girlfriend, he sort of attached himself to Rad Miller and I don't have the qualifications to talk about people and, and, and why they do certain things, you know, so I don't know. I, I, just, I just think that there was a... From what I've seen and from what I've read in her diary, I think that Tomo was a little bit infatuated with, with Rad Miller for whatever reason, and she was rejecting that advance. But it wasn't over for Tomo. One policeman had a gut feeling that would likely turn Thompson into one of Australia's worst killers of the time. Going through photo albums in the house, we found newspaper reports involving the deceased two sisters who'd been killed some years before in a motor vehicle accident. The two girls, aged 14 and 17, died when this car left the road and slammed into a tree. They were incinerated as the car's fuel tank exploded. An inquest found it was an accident. The car hit a tree and burst into flames. The driver, who escaped unhurt, was close family friend Alan Thompson. The concern was if he had, in fact, got away with it, it uh, resulted in the deaths of the other four. It should never have occurred. When Alan Thompson gunned down Radmila Milosevic and her family, investigators discovered that he was also the driver in a car crash that took the lives of her two younger sisters. Was it sheer coincidence that Thompson's name was linked to the deaths of three sisters? Or was there more to it than met the eye? Thompson alleged that he'd been driving towards Canberra, uh, Cooma to Canberra, on the highway with the two girls in the car. beam of another oncoming vehicle caused him to veer off the road. He immediately got out of the car, the driver's side. He went to the front of the vehicle and saw flames coming from under the bonnet. He ran around to the left-hand side of the vehicle and attempted to get the girls out of the vehicle. He was engulfed in flames, and subsequently the two girls died in a motor vehicle accident. I was contacted at work and said that Marianne and Lily had died in the accident and Tomo had been burned. Um, Tomo had burns to his arms, lower arms, where he had tried to get the girls out. The day of the funeral, he was very withdrawn. He was. He wouldn't speak to anybody. A few of us went up to put our arms around him and he more or less pushed us away and he was just very reserved. He'd sometimes wake up through the night screaming out for Mariana, like, and we'd, you know, we'd 
we just tried to, to be there for him. Two months after the girl's funeral, a coronial inquiry into the crash found the deaths of the sisters to be accidental. But Rick Ninness and his partner Tom McQuillan had their doubts. Right. The brief told us that there'd been a motor vehicle accident, simple motor vehicle accident. Looking at the brief, there weren't sufficient answers to say, well, yes, this was a, um, a simple motor vehicle accident. There were questions that needed to be answered in order to corroborate his story. We were very fortunate that the accident squad at the time uh, took a lot of photographs of the vehicle accident. And when you looked at the photographs, I was concerned that the damage didn't correlate with the uh, high impact alleged by Thompson at the time. Travelling at the speed that he said he was travelling, you, one would have thought that there would have been a lot more damage and there was insufficient damage. Thompson said he was driving at 45 miles or 60 kilometres per hour when he was blinded by headlights and went off the road hitting a tree. But according to experts from General Motors Holden, this could not have been the case. Now, that was uh, quickly diffused by the engineers who said that didn't, didn't hold water. They weren't happy with that story at all. And they looked at the photographs and they, uh, put, they all put the impact speed down at about 15 mile per hour. So that said, well, why would someone do that? Would, would it be to protect themselves possibly? And maybe the accident had been staged. So we decided to test our theory out that this was a staged accident and to see what sort of damage would occur um, by rolling the vehicle into a tree because we didn't have the, the tree out at the site, it had been cut down. So we bought an HR Holden and we took it to the police driver training area and we got it on a slope. And we marked the distance between a tree that we believe met the dimensions of the tree on the highway and then we ran the vehicle down towards the tree on a large number of occasions to get the speed right and the distance had to be spot on to recreate the 15 mile per hour speed on impact. We had it all planned, everyone had their role. I think my role was to time it at the, from memory. Um, Rex was to observe. And we had a driver who was rigged up, all padded up, crash helmet lot, ready to crash it in. But once he'd seen how far we were going down the, the slope and uh, the speed, there was a little bit of, um, well, perhaps this might be a bit dangerous. So um, he uh, sort of reneged and it was um, left for volunteers and the only volunteer left was uh, Rick Ninnis. It had to be done. Uh, someone had to do it, so I was the man at the time, so I had to do it. He was placed in the vehicle and sent off in the, on his way and crashed it into the tree. But it was probably important I did do it actually because it gave me a feel for what actually transported in that car and the impact was not severe at all. You certainly knew you'd hit something, but it wasn't severe enough that you would think two people would die. So I supported very much so that that, that was about the speed the vehicle was travelling when uh, Thompson hit the tree with the two girls in it. In our minds, we had to be certain exactly what was going on. If we weren't certain, how could we show that to someone else? We did it because we had to know. But while the similarities between the crash test and the damage to Thompson's car did put a dent in his story, it wasn't anywhere near enough evidence to overturn the original verdict of accidental death. For that, they would need to get answers from an arson expert. Had the car burst into flames? Or was it deliberately lit? And they locked me up for a day in a room with the video and the photos and said, we'll be back at four o'clock, tell us what you think. When Detective Rick Ninnes began his journey into whether Thompson's accident was indeed what he claimed, he never expected that he'd be putting his own safety on the line. And yet, 
it wasn't enough to prove Thompson was a fake or a murderer. His focus was now on the fire that incinerated the girls and how it really started. The coroner's initial finding was that the fire had started under the bonnet of the car. An explanation for the fire was that there's a spring sitting across the battery to hold it down. It had actually had contact with one of the terminals and arced, causing a spark to ignite the fumes under the bonnet. Now, photographs where the vehicle's on the back of a tow truck going away still indicated the headlights were on. Now, that would seem a little bit incongruous if the battery is supposed to have started the fire. If you look at the damage in the engine compartment where the fire was supposedly started, you see some heat damage to the hoses and the wiring, but you don't see any actual burning. A lot of the wiring would be just bare wiring if it did survive at all, but you wouldn't have any insulation on the wiring. I expect the hoses and the fan belts to be burned away. They would have to for a fire to burn that long to get through the firewall. In fact, there are parts of the firewall that haven't been affected by the fire at all. The damage from the fire seemed to be more inside the vehicle rather than in the motor. The motor seemed to be still in working order for a fire of that velocity. So it didn't add up. Why is there a fire inside the cabin, but yet the, the, um, the engine seems to be OK? And that's where the fire was alleged to have started. Thompson had alleged that within minutes, seconds of him getting out of the car, the fire had spread from the engine to the passenger compartment. So, to corroborate or reject his story, the detectives decided to replicate the fire. You got the stop one, yeah? Thank you, I'm over, I'm over. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Pretty good fire. That's what we wanted. Starting to drip through now at the bottom. That's got more oxygen food in that too. We initially poured that petrol <coughs> under the bonnet. What we thought would have been the amount uh, spilled out of a carburetor. There you go, Tom. Mm -hmm. There you go. Forty seconds. That petrol would certainly do night after we put flame to the petrol, but it extinguished itself very quickly because it couldn't travel anywhere. And we subsequently added more fuel and kept trying to do it to try and get that vehicle to in, be engulfed in flames to a large extent. But you virtually had to douse that car in petrol to get it to ignite. That's a bit more like it. And that took quite an amount to be able to get it through the firewall of the vehicle and into the cabin. Come on, Tommy. Four and a half minutes. The wiring under the dash, it's got to get that. It's got to burn that away. The dash is the thing that will start to smoke. Cars will catch fire, but it's a fairly high impact speed that will do it to rupture all the fuel lines, the fuel tank, and to get it up and running to a, uh, a high burning degree. You've got to have a lot of accelerant around it to uh, fuel the flames. 15 minutes now. Yeah, 15 minutes. So to support Thompson's story that, in fact, within a few seconds of the vehicle impacting, he had a, a car totally on fire. But we couldn't establish how it would have happened. It just couldn't have happened the way he said it did. But what we also found was that there would have been time for someone to get out. This was the other thing. By the, that, that was the reason why the firewall was there. You mean you get one of inside the car at the 30 minute mark? Uh... And by timing it, we thought, well, no, it just doesn't add up again. Another part of his story, not being able to get in. You, you should have been able to get in because it took us quite some amount of petrol to be able to say that the, the cabin would have caught fire. 45 minutes is up. Right. In his original statement following the collision in 1982, Thompson claimed the container he was carrying in the car was empty. But when detectives Nines and McQuillan confronted Thompson with their doubts about his version of events... ...changed his story slightly, but only slightly, just enough to uh, give us a reason why there was accelerant in his vehicle and why a fire should have occurred. 
He told them that he'd bought the petrol for his mum's lawnmower in the afternoon and had forgotten to give it to her. He said it was in the car, it must have fallen over and caught in fire. Thompson didn't say anything at the time because he didn't want to get blamed for firing the car. So, were the detectives barking up the wrong tree? Or were their instincts right? The answer was right under their nose. But they were yet to see it. Alan Thompson initially claimed there was no petrol in his car the night his girlfriend and her younger sister were incinerated in a motor vehicle accident. Three years later, he changed his story, saying he did have a container of petrol in the car and it must have fallen over. So had Thompson lied because he didn't want to be blamed for the fire? Or had he perjured himself at the inquest for another reason? If you look at um, a photo of the tree where the car was wrapped around the tree, you'll see that there's a fire below the level of the vehicle. Now, how could that possibly happen if the fire was in the engine bay? Um, it's more consistent, and the photo actually shows this, of a flammable liquid spill uh, running and burning down through the folds of the metal where the car's been damaged. Obviously, I can't say exactly how much petrol had been used, but what I can say is it would have to be in the order of litres inside and, and outside. So you're looking at quite a few litres of petrol spread around inside and outside that vehicle. The case was getting stronger and stronger as we went, and we believe we were heading towards a uh, uh, prima facie case against, uh, against Thompson. But the most damning indication that the accident was a cover-up was hidden among the photos that had papered the walls of the detective's office for the last six months. You can look at something for quite a long time and not notice something. And uh, all of a sudden it hit us that looking at the, uh, the, the females, we noticed that there was some unexplained fluid escaping from the skull. One of the photographs had a distinct round hole in one of the skulls and we kept looking at it. Suddenly we become very curious about this hole. If you look at the photos uh, very closely, it's not all that clear, but you can see that there's a lot of damage to the skulls. Now, it is reported um, both at crematoriums and I believe in the Russian Revolution that you can get like, skulls exploding in fires. And when that happens, it's mainly because the fire is very quick and very hot. There's tremendous steam pressure builds up in the cranium and therefore only one thing can happen, the skull will blow open. Now, if you look at the skull damage in these, that's not consistent with that. They look to me like uh, exit wounds of projectiles, in other words, bullets, and at least in one of the skulls, an entry wound that was very strongly suggestive that these two girls have been shot, shot in the, in the head. In the Supreme Court today, the tragic story of three Canberra sisters unfolded. The Director of Public Prosecutions, Ian Temby QC, said merely the fact that Thompson had been convicted of the murder of one of the sisters was enough to order a new inquest into the deaths of the other two. He said such an inquest would allay public disquiet and set the record straight. Mr Temby said new expert evidence contradicted Thompson's version of the crash, how fast he was going and where in the car the fire started. He said Thompson had now admitted he was carrying a container of petrol and previously he denied that. Dennis Palmer, for Thompson, said the evidence was not new nor of substance and pointed to the cost of holding a new inquest. The only thing left to do was to exhume the bodies and see if there were any forensic evidence available from the bodies. Now, if Thompson's story is right, they should have been burning or scarring the larynx uh, inside the bodies and the lungs of the young girls if they were alive, even though they might have been unconscious. You know, we certainly needed that sort of evidence to uh, substantiate a charge to uh, homicide against him. That order was given, the exhumation was um, undertaken, and um, subsequently um, an examination of those bodies revealed um, gunshot wounds. Bullet wounds were found in one or both of the sisters' bodies after they were exhumed from the Gun Garland Cemetery. Bullet wounds that were consistent with being from a 22 caliber rifle. 
the same caliber Alan Thompson used when he murdered the girl's older sister, Rad Miller, and her family. At the post-mortem examination, the doctor found that there was no burning in the larynx or the internal organs and established beyond doubt that they'd, uh, they'd both were deceased at the time of the fire. Uh, forensic service also found that there was uh, a coating of lead which was left behind as a bullet passed through the skull, inside the skull. So it totally supported the fact that the girls had been shot at the, uh, or in the vehicle, they'd been deceased prior to the fire of the vehicle. So, in, in fact, um, by pulling that brief, um, just as a, uh, out of mere interest for a start off, it just built. And it, um, it, it became a rolling ball for us. And the, the further we rolled it, the, uh, the, the greater the divergence. But what really went on the night the two girls were murdered? What triggered Thompson to shoot his girlfriend and her younger sister? Leading up to the accident, Mariana came to work and spoke to her sister. It was basically the only time she really told us that she was scared of him. Mariana Milosevic and Alan Thompson were boyfriend and girlfriend. When she died in a car accident, where he was the driver, Thompson turned to her older sister, Rad Miller, for comfort. 15 months later, he killed her and her family. With Thompson's name linked to both events, police and forensic investigators re-examined the car crash that had been written off as an accident. Alan Thompson's secret was exposed and the truth of what really happened that fatal night was finally uncovered. He's talking shit now. Can you just stop yelling at her? I'll do what I want, all right? Excuse me. The younger sister had come over to stay with them for the weekend. Oh, Maybe it's such an room. asshole for and there'd been some sort of pending separation. The young girl wanted to break off with him, and uh, he really didn't want that to occur. We believe that the young girl was there to be uh, a witness or support her sister in the breakup. I think he killed the girls in the car um, because Mariana wanted to leave him. Mariana had come into work and said that, you know, he was starting to frighten and she was getting scared of him. And, she didn't want to be with him anymore. Maybe if he wasn't going to have a nobody was. Why he decided to take Lily, to take Rad, to take Tiny and the children, I don't know. Well, there's a definite connection, a modus operandi on what he was doing in both murders. There was. 22 involved in the headshots and the victims and uh, the fact that there was fire used in both occasions to conceal the crime 
So we believe there's a distinct correlation between the two offences. Two years after he murdered the family, and four years after the original inquest into the deaths of the girls, Alan Thompson was found guilty of deliberately killing his girlfriend, Mariana, and her sister, Lily. He fooled a lot of people. He came across as the nice guy, the caring guy, and the Velocivic family trusted Tomo. Tomo was like their own, but they knew after the Richardson murders that he was responsible. Thompson was given a life sentence for each girl's murder to be served concurrently with the four already imposed. I got the most satisfaction um, uh, when Mr Thompson was convicted because it was a uh, it was finalisation for the Milosevic family. Um, I felt really, really uh, sorry and, and deeply um, on their behalf because here's, here was a lady that had lost so many members of her family for no valid reason. She lost out of her family uh, three daughters, uh, a son-in-law and two grandchildren. It was fairly horrific for um, one mother who, who fought and battled and brought those children up uh, on her own all that time to have uh, this, this cove come along and just take them away like he did. Life for them now is 20 odd years later, it's still like yesterday to them. I mean, I know that there's not a day that goes by that any of them that are left don't think of Rad, Tony, the kids, Lily, Mariana. He's really hurt them and really destroyed their family. My thoughts of Tomo are completely different to my thoughts of when I was a young teenager. I don't like him anymore. I hate him, I guess, as much as they do for what he's done to them. In their own way, the family and Bronwyn have erased Alan Thompson from their lives. Tomo's name was put on, on Mariana's headstone. It had loved by Alan. They believed then that she was very much loved by him and, and him by her, but the name was removed. It was scratched off. We no longer exist for an eye for an eye in our society today, but and you can't bring people back, you can't turn the clock back. But I think people in society today like to see those who are involved in those sorts of, of, of crimes to, to be punished. Thompson has been behind bars for the last 20 years and is currently serving his time in a minimum security prison. Hopefully, people like that should never be released back into society. Alan Thompson's a cold fish with no emotion. There is nothing inside of him, I don't believe. Um, yes, the best description I could give you is just a cold fish.